I'm joined now by the President of Israel, Isaac Herzog. Uh, Mr. President, thank you very much indeed yeah. for joining me. Uh, I appreciate you're obviously Happy very busy at the moment, and I, I appreciate you taking the time to talk to us. Let me start by uh, taking you back to October the 7th, the day that was a catalyst for this new war. Where were you that day, and when did you hear about what had happened? It was uh, 6.30 in the morning. I was planning uh, to wake up at around 7.30 because it was a holiday, a Saturday, and a vacation. Actually, the entire week before was a national vacation because it was the Feast of Tabernacles. And um, I was planning to go to synagogue to celebrate the new opening of the Bible as we read each week a portion of the Bible. And so it was Genesis. And um, sirens broke. The silence in the entire neighborhood were torn to pieces by immense sirens and then booms and booms and booms. We immediately realized that we are under missile attack. It was a huge missile attack. In hindsight, we know that there was well over 2,000 missiles launched at all of Israel from Gaza. And the shock was huge, but we thought we ran to the shelters. But we didn't know whether there was anything else. We assumed, okay, missile attack for some reason. I was telling my wife there's a missile attack. And um, then we opened the TV and started getting the news, endless news about atrocities all throughout our southern border, about people being locked in, in shelters and burned and, 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 and under attack. And they call, they call the emergency services. They call the... Uh, studios of television, they speak to the anchorman who's on, the, on TV and say, save us, help us, help us, we're, we're under attack, we're being butchered, we hear the enemy, we hear Arabic behind the door, etc., etc., and the whole hell broke loose. We've gone through the worst atrocity as a nation since the establishment of the State of Israel, the highest amount of Jews killed since the Holocaust, about eight or nine times 9-11 in terms of our national proportion of casualties, but it doesn't end. The cup is filled with poison. It doesn't end. We feel, we meet families all the time. Uh, you know, I met the uh, 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 the uh, Almog Goldstein family. You have three generations, grandparents, parents, children, and many abducted and also killed and missing. And it goes on and on and on all the time. You wrote a piece in the New York Times about this and you talked about going to one of the kibbutz which were attacked and how you had to wash blood off your shoes and how the meetings you had with the families of those who've been taken hostage were the most difficult meetings of your life. Tell me about that. So I went to Beri Kibbutz. By the way, the Kibbutz Beri bears the name of the founder of the labor movement in Israel, Bel Katzanelson, that was his nickname. And Beri was, always looked to me as a, as a heaven. I uh, would go there because I was leader of labor. I loved coming to Beri. It's a huge Kibbutz. The idea of Kibbutz is the real epitomization of the successful of socialism in modern times, meaning everybody shares everything, we, you don't get an independent salary, you remember the kibbutz, you enjoy from the income of the collective. And they had an in, immense industry of printing press and agriculture and things were looking so beautiful and we would come there, they're, they're having dinners and lunches together in the, in, in, in the same dining room and it looked like an incredible society to me, like a, a vision never come true of what equal life should mean in mo uh, for human beings. But in, in any case, um, in Berry, when I went in to see the havoc, the atrocities, the burning homes, in one of the homes, when I walked in, there was a pool of blood still drying. There were scalps. There was a woman's scalp with a rake holding it. That shows how atrocious these people were, how villains they are how crazy, animalistic and barbaric and sadistic they are. And you walk and, and the, the, the house is totally ruined, but you see a picture of grandparents and parents and children 
in, hanging on the security room where they had this their shelter, and the shelter was of course totally burnt. And I assume they're one of the burning bodies there. I mean, families were tied up in barbed wires and burned together. I could only think what they said to the Almighty before they parted earth. And then I, I went and I, since then I keep on meeting families of the hostages. Endless stories. Why would Kfir, a nine-month-old baby, be hijacked? Now he's already 10. His grandmother told us, sorry, he's 10 months old. Okay? Why would Leah, three, three years old, be hijacked where all her family is being killed? They're, they just took her. And so forth and so on. Endless stories of atrocities on the one hand. And the worst of all is not knowing the fate of your loved one on the other hand. A clear Crime against humanity, clear genocide took place in that area. Incidentally, the biggest peace-loving area in Israel, where the center of the peace movement was. One of our friends, Vivian Silver, she's from Barry, she was born in Canada. Vivian was the biggest leader of peace in Israel. She created a, an NGO called Ajik, A-J-I-C. Ajik is Arab Jews, Arabs and Jews together working for peace. Barry had a special fund, Pierce, a special fund where they would allot their money to help the people of Gaza. They had a fund that paid well for, for the people of Gaza. They had members who would drive to the border to take Gazans to, to, to be hospitalized and treated in Israeli medical centers. They would bring food to the, to the fence and give them food. And I'm asking them now, do you really feel that you know who you can trust anymore? When I met that shattered community now as refugees in the Dead Sea in a hotel, when 10% of their members have been totally annihilated, killed, butchered, chopped, burnt, these are the real questions we'll have to face. Your father, Haim, who later became president of Israel, and in fact, you're the only father and son to ever achieve that highest office. Um, he was in the British Army in World War II as an intelligence officer in the armored formations. He fought the Nazis. He took part in the Normandy invasion. He helped liberate Holland and Belgium, amongst other things. He helped capture Heinrich Himmler, one of the main architects of the Holocaust. He took part in the liberation of the Bergen-Belsen concentration camp and he talked about when he when he was at Belsen uh, telling the survivors he was a Jewish officer from Palestine and how they burst into tears at this and you have said before I'll never forget how he described to me the horrors that unfolded before his eyes as one of the first liberators of the death camps including Bergen Belsen the human skeletons in the striped pajamas the hell on earth the stench the heart of darkness and you were asked once what advice you thought your father would give to future generations. And you said, never take the state of Israel for granted. <clears throat> did, did you ever imagine when your father was telling you these stories that you yourself would walk into a scene like you did in that kibbutz, which was so reminiscent of <clears throat> the horrors of the Holocaust? Thank you for rem reminding this to me. It's quite moving for me because my dad always spoke about these moments. My father joined the British Army in order to fight the Nazis. He was a student in, uh, in, uh, at Cambridge and the war broke out. He also served as a, in the Blitz within, you know, in London uh, the, as guarding the streets. He always spoke about the immense resilience of the British people under constant attacks. And then, of course, <clears throat> wrote to his parents that he's joining the British Army to fight the Nazi enemy and, uh, and save Jews. And his experience in Bergen-Belsen, which was the, one of the greatest horrors of humanity, there were piles of bodies of skeletons, dead skeletons there, that, as he depicted the, the awful smell of the atrocities at Bergen-Belsen. And the fact that when he walked in, truly, the, the survivors, they thought that he's a Nazi perpetrator. Mm. 
Well, and he had to turn them to them in Hebrew and Yiddish, which is a Jewish-German language, to tell them, I'm a Jewish officer from the land of Israel coming to save you. And there are still Jews in the world. So that's why it was imprinted in his being. And that's how he passed it on to me and our, to our families. Never take the Jewish state for granted. This is our safe haven. That's where Jews from all over the world, from well over 100 countries, came forward and reestablished their ancient homeland. And it's an incredible country because not only do we have Jews from well over 100 nations originating from there, but also we have non-Jews. We have many Muslims and Christians and Druze of all denominations and Circassians, and we all live together in peace and solidarity despite the tensions of the conflicts around us or the conflict that we have with our neighbors. The truth is people don't know, but these barbaric, sadistic terrorists, they kill dozens and dozens of Muslims on the 7th of October. Mm -hmm. they, be, they killed Bedouins, Bedouin Arab citizens of Israel who went to work. I, had, I went to meet last week the families, the bereaving families of Muslims who were killed and abducted and are hijacked in Gaza. And one of the, cop, the, the, the guys there was a father of nine children. He went with his wife to work. These terrorists, they stopped him on the road and he said to them, I'm a Muslim. They didn't give a damn. They broke the car. They immediately shot at his wife, the mother of nine, again and again and again. And he described to me how he prayed to, to God, to Allah, and bidding farewell from his wife. So it, this tragedy has befallen so many people from so many backgrounds, from 36 nationalities. Mm -hmm. and, the, uh, and the lesson I took from my father is never, never again. Jews will not accept, the Jewish state will not accept these atrocities within its borders, killing its citizens. And we have complained and, and said and mentioned endlessly to the world that we are under terror attacks constantly. Almost 10,000 missiles were launched at us since we pulled out of Gaza in 2007, all from Hamas. We've, uh, we've alerted the entire universe and the family of nations that there's an empire of evil from Tehran emanating with a whole culture of hate to eradicate all of us. And I say to my friends all over the world, especially in Europe, guys, if it weren't for us, Europe would be next because the culture of hate that these guys have brought forward, ISIS, Al-Qaeda, Hamas, and Islamic Jihad, and the Houthis in Yemen, and their entire culture of hate simply wants all of us out. They don't accommodate Jews Christians or even moderate Muslims. They are seeing the inclusion of Israel in the region, a vision of peace which we all believe in, as a threat to them. And most importantly, they are want, they, all they want is to chop our heads and get to you guys next. This is the real challenge of the world today. One of the most extraordinary things to witness uh, as a non-Jew, I'm an Irish Catholic looking at all this, but within hours of what happened, uh, there were mass protests all around the world, from New York to Sydney, where there were people chanting gas the Jews in Sydney, one of the great cities of the world. In London, there were protests in my high street up near the Israeli embassy, mass protests with many people celebrating what had happened. And, and I found that unconscionable that any human being's first reaction to this appalling terror attack would be one of jubilation. We then saw US professors at American universities, one at Cornell, caught on camera saying how exhilarated he felt by what had happened. We've seen students again at American universities beaming pro-Hamas rhetoric onto campus walls. We've seen Jewish students barricading themselves in libraries for fear of their safety from, from chanting mobs. And in these protests in, in London and New York and others, many, many people there at pro-Palestinian protests chanting jihad and from the river to the sea. When you see all this, 
as a reaction to this appalling attack on Israel. How does that make you feel? You know, I was talking to my wife the other day. I still remember September 93. <clears throat> in September 93, 13th September, there was a ceremony at the White House lawn but, uh, where Prime Minister Yitzhak Rabin and uh, the leader of the Palestinian National Movement, uh, Yasser Arafat, shook hands under the auspices of President Clinton and signed the Oslo Accords, or started them, and there was uh, the entire nation was watching it. And I was telling then my wife, uh, we had a baby, we had two babies. This, you know what? Perhaps our children will not have to fight. Well, that reality has been shattered long ago, and we understand that we always will have to fight. And um, as opposed to um, previous generations, we have now the state of Israel, and we have the tools to fight, and Jews can fight all over the world. Jews are threatened. I have friends from all corners of the earth, people I grew up with, I studied with. They are extremely frightened. And I, and, and I have friends, including one of your most distinguished colleagues who was in Israel last week, told me I feel much safer in Israel. He's Jewish. Now, this is unacceptable because history teaches us that anti-Semitism is always the beginning, but the tragedies unfold to all other human beings. This is the greatest disease of humanity. Anti-Semitism is the greatest disease of humanity. What these people are chanting is not only immoral and unjust, but it's a reflection of their own knowledge of things or their own moral compass. How could you justify, truly, how could you justify chopping children's heads? How could you justify burning entire families? How could you justify raping women of all ages and taking them hostage? How could you justify tearing off people's women's and men's scalps? How could you justify these horrific atrocities, broadcasting, broadcasting live, how you carry out these atrocities, taking a mother's iPhone and broadcasting to the entire, her entire uh, WhatsApp group, how you are torturing her husband, her, uh, killing her daughter and, and, her, and, her ba and, and her young children. And this goes on and on and on. This is a test for humanity and a moral call for moral clarity. And human beings and leaders must be outraged and understand that when you give a nation the right for self-defense, it has a right for self-defense, meaning you have to get to this um, barbaric, sadistic regime. You have to catch them. You have to remove them in order, by the way, to <clears throat> enable the people, on our neighbors, perhaps to get rid of that awful regime and most importantly, be very firm as to what's evil and what's good. We are fighting for good. We saw evil in our eyes. We are bereaving because of evil. We are in agony because of evil. We must stand up against evil with no mercy and make sure that we overcome as a family of nations because the entire world order is at risk. The uh, American congresswoman, Rashida Tlaib, tweeted, from the river to the sea is an aspirational call for freedom, human rights and peaceful coexistence, not death, destruction or hate. What is your response to that? She simply, above everything else, I mean, all these atrocious comments, all this terrible view of things, she simply doesn't know history. The world recognized the Jewish state's rights for independence in, December, in November 1947 in the UN General Assembly. The family of nations accepted. They are, our borders were, of course, agreed. That border was violated by this terror attack. And we have strived for peace all throughout since then. We've extended our hands for peace. We signed peace agreement. We defended ourselves. We fought for peace. 
we were willing to go for peace. But unfortunately, the entire culture of hate, the culture of jihad, jihad, may I remind you about John the Jihadist, who simply would show the entire world how he takes a prisoner and cuts his head? That's what jihad is all about. And when people chant that is the not a revolutionary moment. When people chant from the river to the sea, what does that mean to you? That, that means annihilating Israel because we have the Jordan River and the Mediterranean Sea. This is, of course, a call to annihilate the state of Israel, the only nation state of the Jewish people on earth. The Jewish people have founded this state after returning to their ancient homeland, rebuilding it, and rec being recognized by the international community, unfortunately, following the worst atrocity of humanity, which is the Holocaust, where six million of our people were burned, gassed, killed, and tortured, and, and killed by all sorts of the most terrible means in, 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 in the most violent attack humanity has seen. Where, whereby the forces of good led by the United States of America, by the British, uh, the United Kingdom, of course, by the USSR in those days, they all, and together with all other nations, had to fight the Nazis and their allies and liberate Europe. And that brought the change in the world. That brought the creation of the United Nations. That led to the Human Rights Charter that brought to the uh, definition of what genocide is all about and crimes against humanity. Well, the new world order was created. Well, the world order has been challenged and challenged dramatically. On, and this on, uh... is the real challenge in facing all leaders of the world. Guys, don't be mistaken. You have to be tough and strong to fight this evil. On Saturday, it's Armistice Day in uh, the UK a very important day where we obviously commemorate and honour those who sacrificed their lives in, in the wars. Um, your father undoubtedly would have lost people that were close to him when he served in the World War II. Uh, how do you feel about the fact there is a, a pro-Palestinian march, a big one, planned to take, part, take place on Saturday, on Armistice Day in London? There are calls here from many people now for this march to be banned because many of the people marching in these marches have been chanting jihad from the river to the sea and other things like that. It's uh, atrocious and hypocritic and I call upon all decent human beings to object to the march and ban it because the symbol of that day is a symbol of victory and it's, it's a symbol of doing good because when you fight evil, sometimes you have to fight. You have to fight evil in order to uproot evil. Unfortunately, we live with evil throughout the ages. And um, what we are seeing constantly is unbelievable evil. Unbelievable evil. We've seen terror. We've been harassed by terror all our lives. Terror is what stopped the Israeli-Palestinian peace. Terror is what undermines peace. We were in a historic process for the last 50 years of inclusion of Israel in the region, of peace agreements with Egypt, with Jordan, and the, the accords with the Palestinians, the Abraham Accords, which of course four other Arab nations signed with us, the United Arab Emirates, the Kingdom of Bahrain, the Kingdom of Morocco, and Sudan. They all signed with us agreements. We were moving forward. We had serious uh, deliberations about the possibility of signing a peace agreement with Saudi Arabia and normalization. Well, this attack is part of a grand scheme to undermine this process of inclusion and doing peace and turn the region into a region of war. And that is why world community has to be forceful and strong and oppose all these efforts and move strongly towards the inclusion of Israel in the region while giving security to Israel and all its neighbors. How do you I feel? commend the world leadership. I commend President Joe Biden, Prime Minister Rishi Suna, and the opposition uh, leader Starmer and Prime Minister and President of 
Franz Macron and many others, of course, who've stood up with us against this process of evil. And this is the test of humanity and the entire world community these days. Let me talk now, Mr. President, about Israel's response, because I wanted to give you enough time to really explain how you feel as the president of a country that suffered that terror attack, and you've done so very evocatively and very powerfully. But as you know, there is mounting concern over the, the, the scale of Israel's response to what happened. Many people talking and asking the question, what is proportionate? In your mind, is there any response that could be deemed proportionate, or will you do whatever it takes as a country to eradicate Hamas? So first, let's understand the rules of international law, because uh, most of the uh, nations tell us you have the right to defend yourself. We are speaking about almost 20 years of bombardments from Gaza, on and off, ceasefires, agreements, operations, wars, whilst looking for ways and means to change the equation to war peace. Gaza was taken over in 2007 by a brutal coup of Hamas. It was taken out from the hands of the Palestinians, Palestinian Authority, which is controlled by Fatah movement, and they literally butchered their family members and took over Hamas and leading it into a platform of war by Iran. They filled it up with ammunition rather than doing anything possible to help their own people and upgrade their living standards, they kept on fighting and fighting. In the last two years, there was progress. Israel agreed for the first time to open up Gaza for Gazan employees to come to work in Israel. Tens of thousands of Gazans were employed in Israel and money flowed in. They broke bread and money flowed in and the economy grew. Little did we understand, naively, that many of those working in Israel also collected and gathered information about their employees, uh, had uh, uh, given information to Hamas uh, as to where each house is, where to land with your gliders, how to break into your fence, and how to get to uh, the cities and towns in which they worked in. And the money that they, they took and, they and, and all the income from your taxpayers' money for international projects in Gaza was basically used and taken by Hamas to build this machine of, uh, of cruelty and barbarism so that Mr. we've President, seen let me, on the 7th of October. Let me just say, Mr. President, I, I completely agree that Hamas should be eradicated. I think most right-minded people can understand that there can never be peace now after what Hamas did on October the 7th. But like I say, many people are looking at Israel's response now. Nearly 10,000 Palestinians have been killed since October the 7th. These are figures, I must say, which are reported by the Hamas-controlled Palestinian Health Ministry. They say nearly 4,000 children have been killed. We know that uh, on Saturday night, the al Maghazi refugee camp, which is just to the south, uh, was bombed. Uh, reportedly 50 so let, people... So let me explain. Well, well, let me ask you on that one specifically, because I don't think there's been a response yet by Israel. Hamas say that was an Israeli airstrike. Is that true? And it, how do you justify bombing somewhere that is known to be a refugee camp? We don't. I'm not aware of this at all. And a lot, there's a lot of fake coming out of Hamas uh, information channels. But first, let me explain to you what we're, what, what's happening. When you have the right for self-defense, you have the right for self-defense. We have been attacked from people's homes. We have been attacked from schools, from mosques, from shops, and people's living rooms. Now, you or your viewers, do they have a bomb? Do they have a missile? Do they have a mortar in their living rooms? There are missile launchers that send missiles 200 kilometers. That must be a huge missile. I yesterday tweeted, as our forces have, have walked into a theme park and a playground for children, where they found launchers in the ground ready to launch missiles on our children. And I say it specifically, if they are ready to launch missiles on our children, we must go and eradicate that site. Same goes for the houses. Now, how do we behave according to international humanitarian law? We alert. 
the citizens. We tell them in your home, there's a missile launcher, get out of your home, go down to the safe zone in southern Gaza, where you are getting enough humanitarian aid, and we will eradicate that infrastructure of Hamas. We sent millions of leaflets. We called and met and text and messages and WhatsApps and SMSs and phone calls by 10 million numbers. But Mr. President, we let me told just the on Gazan that. people, let go me just down. On, let Wait. Me just on that. So at the end, at the end, we have to go out and we have to go in and eradicate that infrastructure. Of course, we check ourselves with lawyers and jurists. We try to make as safe as possible not to hurt civilians. And believe me, and I say it outright from the bottom of my heart, we care for every civilian in Gaza. I care. And I can tell you stories about me helping Gazan citizens all throughout my career. But with all the respect, there comes a moment where you have no other choice. Because if we will recur again, we'll go through the same atrocities again. But I understand, that Mr. President, let me, to be clear, be eradicated. As, as I said, I absolutely support Israel's right to defend itself. In fact, I think you have a duty as a country uh, to, and a responsibility to your people to try and stop Hamas doing again what they did. And only last week, a Hamas spokesman said that they would try again and again and again to replicate what happened on October the 7th. So you don't need to keep telling me how bad Hamas are. I get it, and they have to go. It's just how you do this. And that is what is coming under criticism. Queen Rania of Jordan has called for an immediate ceasefire in a new interview. She says there has to be a collective call for a ceasefire I know some who are against a ceasefire arguing it will help Hamas. However, in that argument, they are inherently dismissing the deaths and, in fact, endorsing and justifying the deaths of thousands of civilians. That's not just morally reprehensible, short-sighted, and not entirely uh, rational. If Israel, she says, managed to eliminate all of Hamas, the root cause of this conflict is its illegal occupation and routine human rights abuses, illegal settlements, disregard to UN resolutions and international law. If we do not address the root causes, you can kill the combatant, but you cannot kill the cause. What is your response to Queen Rania? I, I don't intend to start arguing with Queen Rania because I, you know, I know exactly uh, the considerations and the limitations of the uh, Jordanian regime under the circumstances, but I would expect a much better understanding of the situation on the ground. First of all, there must be no justification under any circumstances, none whatsoever, to the atrocities that we have seen and gone through, and no justification to terror, none whatsoever. By the way, this hate regime that attacked us, the first thing they'll do, unfortunately, they'll try to attack Jordan as well. We're all in this together. They'll try to attack other regimes as well. They're all in this together. We're all in this together. We are all nations who want to move to peace, and we're attacked by this philosophy of hate of Al-Qaeda, ISIS, Hamas, Jihad, and the rest. They want all of us out of here, and they all want all of us wiped off, and they want a major Islamic fundamentalist regime throughout the Middle East. That's the real story. And that's the real challenge. With all the respect regarding settlements and all that, are, these are issues that have been discussed in a peace process. They should be discussed in a peace process. There are many ideas to have peace with the, between us and the Palestinians and how to move towards the solutions such as the two-state solution. But it cannot happen if you support or if you give any credit in any way, directly or indirectly, to terror. We cannot accept terror. We have to fight terror. And then when we fight terror, we can sit down and talk. We tried sitting down and talking for decades already. I'm just, Unfortunately, like I said, Mr. remember I... in the 1990s, Piers, in the yeah. 1990s, I remember. In the 1990s, terror suicide bombers killed the process. That's mm. the same like now. That's their tactics. That's how they do it. But there and are many the end, people, all Mr. United, President, as you the know. The entire region to fight terror. I understand that. And I, like I say, I agree with the mission statement to get rid of Hamas, but I share people's concern about the sheer scale of 
what is going on in Gaza, not least the mounting humanitarian crisis. You have over a million people whose homes have been displaced. Angelina Jolie, the actress, is also uh, a special envoy to the UN uh, High Commission for Refugees. She said this, this is the deliberate bombing of a trapped population who have nowhere to flee. Gaza has been an open-air prison for nearly two decades and is fast becoming a mass grave. 40% of those killed are innocent children. Whole families are being murdered while the world watches. And with the active support of many governments, millions of Palestinian civilians, children, women, families are being collectively punished and dehumanised, all while being deprived of food, medicine and humanitarian aid against international law. By refusing to demand yeah, a humanitarian so ceasefire many... and blocking the UN Security Council from imposing one on both parties, world leaders are complicit in these crimes. So she's saying that you are committing war crimes here. What do you say to that? That I totally reject her claims. I think she's never been in Gaza. She's never been here. She never went to visit and see the facts on the ground. With all the respect, people in Gaza know there is war, but there is no uh, you know, humanitarian crisis that, are not, that, that, that does not enable them to survive. On the contrary, there is a safe zone which was agreed by the international community in Israel in the south part of Gaza in order to move the citizens to that zone, to take full care of them. There's a major dramatic increase in humanitarian aid to Gaza, which Israel has supported dramatically uh, in conjunction with the United States and United Nations and many other nations. The Gazan, uh, the Gazan people are, 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 they can move there so that we uproot this terror regime. This is what we know. Angelina Jolie does not offer the Israeli people any ability to defend themselves by saying what she is saying. And may I speak about her comment that Gaza is a, is, is a jail. Gaza is a jail not because of Israel. Israel pulled out of Gaza to the last inch. Gaza is an Iranian base filled with terror smuggled with tons and tons and tons of ammunition. This is the tragedy that has befallen the Gazan people. Perhaps the outcome of this war will enable the Gazan people who deserve decent, good life to enjoy it under a different regime that will enable movement towards peace. So part of the problem, may Mr. I President. Further, let, let me wait, ask wait, wait, wait. I have to okay. clear this point, Pierce, course, with all due course. respect. Yes, of course. It was the Hamas who destroyed the electricity lines of Gaza by shooting these missiles. It was Hamas who destroyed the water infrastructure of Gaza by shooting these missiles. Israel is supplying water. Israel is enabling humanitarian aid, despite the fact that not one detail came about the hostages who are there now uh, in, in, in Gaza, 240 of them, it, not is one. It, just to Israeli clarify people one point. are asking themselves time and again, yeah. how come with all these hypocrites all around the world, how come none of them bother to say, you know what, humanitarian aid, give information about the hostages, release the hostages. It can't go this way. You will tell me, of course, you know, the civilians mm. are not to blame. Fine. If the civilians are not to blame, then please enable Israel to uproot these terrorists, get the mob out of the city, clean the city and enable people to go back into their lives. Will there be any ceasefire or humanitarian pause if the hostages are not released? So first and foremost, you know, I'm a head of state. I don't enjoy any executive powers. This is under all of this, including the war cabinet is under the domain of the government, the emergency cabinet, the United uh, Cabinet of uh, National Unity under the leadership of Prime Minister Netanyahu. They are discussing all of this, including with our friends and allies all throughout the world who understand the, the tragedy, understand the challenge and understand the ideas of how do we aim to get out of it. But we are not dealing with rational enemies. It's not an enemy that you have certain rules of the Geneva Convention. You are dealing with psychopaths. You are dealing with a psychopathic leader who has driven his people into the abyss. Unfortunately, it's extremely painful. Let me tell you, I care about Gazan children. I truly do. 
But with all due respect, first and foremost, I have to defend our people. We have to defend the Israeli nation. We've gone through atrocities. This war was coerced upon us. We did not want to go to war. We are not a warmongering nation. We are a peace-loving nation. But you say that, Mr. We President. We extend our hands Mr. for President, peace me... again and again. I and we get missiles on our head. And hypocritical comments by leaders from all around, or all, all sorts of figures from around the but world. who've never but... been here one day. Never looked in the eyes of families who've gone through the worst of atrocities. But let me let me throw this back at you, which is uh, the the comments of Ami Hai. Eliyahu, a far-right minister in the Israeli government, who's just been suspended after suggesting Israel may use nuclear weapons against Gaza. That's one way, he said. That's an option. He also said there are no non-combatants in Gaza and the Palestinians should move to Ireland or the desert. Those are incredibly incendiary and inflammatory remarks. And if you're a Palestinian or if you're an Arab and you hear a member of Israel's government talking about nuking Gaza then you think that there is a callous disregard for human life in Gaza, don't you? So that's a, a words of rubbish by uh, someone who has no authority, no knowledge, and no involvement in the real decision-making process. It is very regrettable, and uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu uh, immediately denied it and uh, took action uh, towards this minister and called him now to... Uh, a call where he's going to explain to him how wrong he is. Uh, it is absolutely absurd and nobody really gives any importance to these words of rubbish. Let's turn to some other words, which I don't think are rubbish, but are certainly uh, worth uh, mentioning to you. President Obama, the former American president, said the Israeli government's decision to cut off food, water and electricity to a captive civilian population threatens not only to worsen the growing humanitarian crisis, it could further harden Palestinian attitudes for generations, erode global support for Israel, play into the hands of Israel's enemies, and undermine long-term efforts to achieve peace and stability in the region. And if you want to solve the problem, he says, then you have to take in the whole truth and you have to admit nobody's hands are clean. All of us are complicit to some degree. Do you agree with him? So uh, President Obama, I don't know when he wrote and made that statement because there is a major supply of food, water and humanitarian aid to Gaza. It flows in. It has been increased dramatically. I met with Secretary of State Tony Blinken on Friday. The, he met with the Israeli cabinet. He discussed it and there is a dramatic increase. I met with the Under Secretary of the United Nations in, his, uh, in my office last week, and he thanked Israel for these enormous humanitarian steps forward. So I think the situation we, which we monitor on an hourly basis is much more reasonable than you depict it. And yes, I don't shy away from the pains and sufferings of many people, but at the end of it all, let's understand the situation. You cannot enable the Israeli nation, which is in shelters, to, go, to return to the same reality which was before the 7th of October. We cannot. First of all, people deserve to go back to their homes. Why would they go to their homes if they know their neighbors want to swallow them again well, I agree with atrocious with that. terror? I agree with that, Mr. President. And but... So, so, that, so that, that, the real issue here is that I think the international community needs to tell all the supporters of Hamas, all the Arab nations who express... Uh, support for Hamas or Arab leaders or other leaders and tell them you are to blame. You are to blame because you're enabling this evil regime to come back again rather than removing the evil regime finally and enabling a rebuilding of a, uh, a decent life for the Palestinian people. But you talk about the fact that Israeli people want to go back to their homes and of course they do and absolutely they're safety was removed from them. The depravity of October the 7th has caused huge trauma to not just people in Israel, but Jewish people around the world. I completely get that. But what do Gazan people do? Over a million have been displaced from their homes. If you could just explain to me, how do the Gazan people come back to their homes if they've all been obliterated in the north of Gaza? they will be able to rebuild their homes like in the past. It's not the first time that they were under war. Unfortunately, it's extremely tragic. But you don't give me an answer to 
how exactly am I going to live with the fact that in their homes, and they, and they saw these missiles from their homes. They saw the terrorists coming out of their homes. They saw the tunnels dug in their homes. They saw their mosques being filled. They saw their hospitals. The hospitals, which were financed by so many countries, including EU countries and other countries, become the center of command of this terror attack, this terrorist organization, meaning giving no hope to them, to their children and grandchildren. Hopefully, when this ends, these terrible circumstances end, these horrific circumstances end, we will be able to offer hope to the Palestinians in Gaza to go back, rebuild their homes, and finally have decent lives with a different regime that will enable progress and peace in the region like we all need to have. Final question. Many people would agree with you that Hamas has to go before any peace uh, can be achieved. But many people also, including many Israelis, according to latest polls, believe that it cannot be achieved with Prime Minister Netanyahu, who's still in office either. Many think that what happened on October the 7th was a catastrophic failure of security and defence, and the buck should stop with him. You yourself have said before about Netanyahu, I'm not sure he has the guts to do it with regards to moving towards peace and a two-state solution. Should Prime Minister Netanyahu step down? You know, I'm a, the head of state, as the president of the state, the political system has its own processes. I made clear in a national speech from the parliament that they, the day after the war will come where all these issues will be discussed. We are a vibrant democracy. We don't shy away from anything. But right now, we're all united. We're all united in one goal. We must return the hostages back. We must overcome and prevail against our enemies. And we must bring peace and security to our borders and our peoples. This is my only aim at this point. Mr. President, I really appreciate you giving me so much time, more than you planned to, and I acknowledge that, thank and you. I appreciate it. And thank you very much indeed for joining me today. Thank you very much.